way they saw it was launch day. This debris comes off the tank, rams into the leading edge just below the front edge, and cracks a piece of that leading edge structure. This leaves a gap. It flies for 16 days with the gap. The gap doesn't hurt anything. It's not measured. No one knows it's there. Reentry day. Almost immediately, as soon as the, the air begins heating up, it begins entering through that thin gap, several centimeters wide, perhaps 30 or 40 centimeters long, into the wing. The hot air goes to work on the aluminum inside, softening it. Other pieces nearby begin sagging, tearing loose. The gap gets larger. The blast gets higher, spreads through the wing, begins being noticed by the sensors. By then, it's too late. By then, the wing is doomed, the shuttle's doomed, and the crew is doomed. But many now feel that the story needn't have ended there. A growing number of people believe that those astronauts did not need to die, and that despite the damage, they could have been brought back to Earth alive. It all began with that fateful decision to rely solely on Crater. If people had known and recognized the extent of the damage, there were many different ways to play this out, and many of those ways involved the crew surviving. With hindsight, this is what NASA could have tried. First, if it had used telescopes, it would have gained a far more accurate picture of the damage. Now, I would have done a lot of things different. And I think that we're seeing in the investigation of the Gaiman Commission, we're seeing that clearly they should have taken the photographs so that they had knowledge of what the damage was while they were on orbit. Even if telescopes weren't available, NASA could have asked one of the astronauts to leave the shuttle and examine the wing in space. To inspect that part of the leading edge of the wing and over the edge of it underneath would have made the crew have to go out onto one of the doors, open doors of the shuttle, and then look over the edge. It's about 15 feet down to the wing. Eyeballs right up against the wing and over the edge. What do you see? Expletive deleted. Once it knew what it was dealing with, NASA had several options to bring the crew home safely. It could have tried to bring Columbia through the atmosphere while protecting the damaged left wing. They could have re-entered at a different angle, favoring the undamaged right side. You might have led sort of sideways, crabbing the shuttle in, scorching the good side, protecting the damaged side. Or changing the angle of attack, the pitch of the nose, which would again change the heat profile somewhat. That might have bought you a little bit of time and a few less degrees of heat on the left wing. Could that have saved it? I sure would have died trying. If the damage was not too serious, then using this method, they might have been able to land safely. And even if that wasn't possible, there was another option, bailout. For a bailout, they would only have needed to get the shuttle down to 40,000 feet. The important thing is to get 
get the crew low enough to the ground so they can bail out. They will blow the hatch. There's a pole that extends out the hatch that they hook onto and jump out. The pole carries them down below the wing. If they just jumped out the hatch directly, they'd go into the wing. This way, the crew could have leapt from the stricken shuttle and parachuted safely to Earth. It is something they were trained to do. But even if this wasn't possible, NASA still had another, much more ambitious option. A rescue mission. At the time of the disaster, the shuttle Atlantis was being prepared for launch. NASA could have sent it up to rescue the crew within weeks. Even if a shuttle is on the launch pad, it would not typically have been designed to go into the same orbit that another shuttle is in. But NASA could very quickly adapt an emergency like this to adjust that mission to get to that orbit. While NASA would have been working furiously on the ground preparing the Atlantis, the Columbia crew would be facing a threat from the very air that they breathe. The problem would be the carbon dioxide that the crew breathes out. It builds up in the cabin. It's scrubbed out with chemical canisters that are used up. Without a new supply, they would be poisoned by bad air before a rescue mission could reach them. But even this problem was surmountable. NASA could have sent up supplies on one of the many available unmanned rockets. One of the ways would be to find a rocket, buy it, lease it, put half a ton of supplies in a box on top of it, launch it into the flight path of the shuttle, send out the two men in the spacesuits, grab the package. You now have extra supplies. You can last another few weeks and just wait. With clean air, the crew could survive for weeks while NASA made the Atlantis ready. Within hours of launch, the rescue shuttle would be right next to Columbia, and then would begin the biggest spacewalk in history. They can do it. Fly up nearby, and probably just hook a line between the two of them. Down that line, using hooks on the line, two of the spacewalkers from Atlantis would go up to the Columbia and bring the people out. This kind of rescue mission is something that, that there will be a Hollywood movie about because uh, it is really science fiction. But the NASA people could have done it. A rescue mission like this would have been a major achievement for NASA and a public relations coup. Proof that they had the expertise and skills to do remarkable things. The tragedy is, none of these options was even considered. <laughs>